welcome to another exciting educational edition of the S Factor. I'm your host Chuck Shazer. Welcome aboard my starship. I'm your captain and I hope you enjoy your journey today as we explore the solar system, explore the galaxy, and we talk about all things terrestrial and extraterrestrial right here on the S Factor. Here we are, October 3rd, 2020. We are in the season of Halloween. So I thought about that and I was like, well, what can we talk about today on the S-Factor? And what about the science of ghosts? We're going to cover that today. We're going to talk about the science news first. A lot of things happened this month in the world of science. I can't wait to get, that, to, get to that with you. Really cool stuff. Thank you for joining me right here on Cruising 92.1 WVLT. You can catch me here the first Saturday of every month at 1 o'clock right here on Cruising 92.1 WVLT. You can also watch me on the Science Animated Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash science animated. You can connect with me on twitter.com slash science animated. And of course, the S Factor is brought to you by scienceanimated.net. ScienceAnimated.net has a lot of cool educational, science educational content for your young one. And that's not to say that you probably wouldn't enjoy some of that content yourself. There's Science Animated, The Human Body, which is a DVD and a stream. You can purchase that on the website. It helps support the show. And there's YouTube series. There's a series called Orbit Show. That's available to watch. There's other series in the work works. There's actually a series I'm, I'm going to be working on very soon called The Giants of Science. How cool is that? It's going to be, we're going to explore the, the most important historical figures in the world of science. Who contributed what? And it's going to be some really, really awesome stuff as far as that's concerned. There's a coloring book in the works. There's a free page of the coloring book available at scienceanimated.net for you to enjoy. I hope you check it out. Scienceanimated.net. That's my website. And if you can support my website, support my, uh, my sponsors of the show, that would be fantastic. I appreciate every share, every like. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, if you will. Help us grow. Help, help me create, help me bring science anime to the forefront, bring science to the forefront. I thank you in advance for that. So the year is zooming by. Here we are in October. We had, if you're listening to me and you're in the Philadelphia area, New Jersey area, we had a pretty hot summer this year. Actually, I think it was one of the hottest summers on record. And now things are slowing down. There's a lot there's a lot less grass to cut. Things are moving towards winter. Here we are in autumn. Of course, that just started. And there is a ton of stuff to get into in the world of science. It's very, very fascinating world of science. Again, thank you for joining me today. Let's get right into the science news, shall we? You may have heard about this. Earth has a new mini-moon. Earth's new mini-moon might be a rocket humans launched into space in the 1960s. Earth is getting a new moon, small moon, but it might have been made by people. Astronomers at the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona first detected the object back in February as a flash of light darting across space. Right this moment, it's not in orbit around the Earth, but it's nearby, and it's going to enter Earth's orbit for a while in 2020 before heading out to circle the Sun again. The initial assumption was that this mysterious blip was an asteroid. The object, termed 2020 S02 by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, appears to have been temporarily captured by Earth's gravity. Earth has captured many moons like this before, and scientists have spotted them a couple of times in recent years. It's a natural part of our planet's movement through space. But some observers now say this mini-moon might not be natural after all. People built it, they think, back in the 1960s. There's been some disagreement on this point, which played out in an astronomy message board known as the Minor Planet Mailing List, an online community frequently frequented by professionals and hobbyists. The issue is that 2020 S02 is in an orbit around the Sun that closely matches Earth's. Objects like that sometimes fall into Earth's gravity and end up orbiting for a little while. There are plenty of natural asteroids that behave this way, 
and there are even rocket parts that humans have launched into space that have similar orbits. By analyzing 2020 S02's current movements in time by using computer simulations, observers have worked out that this object would have last orbited Earth in 1966 or 67. That could mean that 1966 or 67 is when it was launched into orbit in the first place, or when 2020 S02 naturally approached Earth. But distinguishing the two possibilities is tricky. Initially, Sam Dean, an amateur astronomer in California, posted that no 1966 or 67 launches match 2020 SO2's behavior, meaning that the curious object was likely natural. Then, Paul Chodos, director of NASA's Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, told CNN that it was likely a rocket from Surveyor 2, an uncrewed NASA moon mission that launched on September 20, 1966, the object's orbit is so similar to Earth as he said that it probably came from Earth. Another astronomer, Tony Dunn, created a simulation of the object's path, which will take it very close to Earth in December and again in February. As it comes closer, more detailed observations will settle the matter. But in the meantime, we're left wondering whether Earth's incoming mini-moon is a long-lost thing from this planet or a space rock dropping in for a short visit. That was from LiveScience.com. How cool is that? We're not sure exactly what it is yet. You know, we went to the moon in 1969. It could be the prelude to that, an object that would predate, of course, that mission. Now, this next story is for you, those of you who may have a sweet tooth. Listen, I have a sweet tooth, and this caught my attention right away. Ready? A man in Massachusetts died after eating too much black licorice which contains a compound known to be toxic in large doses, according to a new report. The 54-year-old man was in a fast food restaurant when he suddenly gasped, began shaking, and lost consciousness, according to the report published Wednesday in the New England Journal of Medicine. Emergency medical personnel found that the man was experiencing ventricular fibrillation, a life-threatening heart rhythm problem. The man received CPR and briefly regained consciousness before being rushed to the hospital. If you saw something like this and you were eating in a fast food restaurant, you'd be horrified. But it wasn't anything the man was eating in the restaurant. It was, apparently, his penchant for black licorice. A discussion with the man's family revealed that he had a poor diet, consuming one or two large packs of soft candy every day and little else. A few weeks back earlier, the man had switched from eating red, fruit-flavored candy to black licorice candy according to the Associated Press. Black licorice often contains a compound called glycerhizin, which is derived from licorice root, according to the Food and Drug Administration. Consuming too much licorice root or candies flavored with licorice root can be dangerous because that compound lowers the body's potassium levels. This, in turn, can lead to high blood pressure and abnormal heart rhythms. In the man's case... Very low potassium levels led to his heart problems. The man received treatment to restore his potassium levels, along with multiple other treatments in the intensive care unit, including being placed on a ventilator. Despite these efforts, the man died 32 hours after arriving at the hospital. Now, one thing to keep uh, in note here, although the death is an extreme case, eating just two ounces, listen to this, Eating just two ounces of black licorice a day for two weeks can, can cause heart rhythm problems, particularly for people ages 40 and older. In 2019, researchers reported the case of an 84-year-old man in Canada whose habit of drinking several glasses of homemade licorice tea a day caused his blood pressure to soar to dangerous levels. Think about that old adage, right? I love eating foods of all kinds. And yes, I have a sweet tooth. My wife will attest to that. But we all have to realize that things should be done in moderation. That is a great rule to have. Moderation is key. Now, the FDA regulates how much of that compound is allowed in food. But it still recommends that people avoid eating large amounts of licorice at any one time. Of note, many licorice or licorice-flavored products manufactured in the U.S. do not actually contain any licorice. 
but instead are flavored with anise oil, which has the same smell and taste, but does not contain that, that compound that unfortunately um, severely hurt this gentleman. Was fatal, in fact. So something to keep in mind, of course, remember what they're saying here. The guy did not have a great diet. So this compound found in the black licorice brought his, his potassium levels down dangerously low. You know, of course, potassium, as you may know, is found in bananas. Pretty sure it's found in potatoes as well. So it's important to have a good diet, the best diet you can possibly have. Mix it up with fruits and vegetables. And this was a, an unbelievable, an unbelievable story. I couldn't believe this when I saw it, and I had to share it because... Man dies after eating bags of black licorice every day. That kind of grabs your attention right away. But as they say here, his diet wasn't the best, and and that is very unfortunate. I want to take a quick time out and talk about something that is probably affecting lots of people out there. The fact that you know gyms were closed. I think they're starting to open now. However, if you find yourself not comfortable with going back to a gym, there's an option for you. And of course, I'm talking about one of my favorite sponsors, Tawny Basil, that and she runs Tawny Fit, which is a way for you to get in the best shape of your life. She's a personal trainer. She's a certified personal trainer. And she will go to a gym and work out with you. She will do it uh, virtually with you, which is a, a wonderful thing that is helping people stay in great shape during you know, this horrible pandemic that we've been uh, confronted with in this country and has enabled people to, it gives them another opportunity to stay in shape. And I was going to have Tawny on the radio show today on the S Factor to talk about what she's doing with her clients. She was unable to come on. She's, she's a new mommy. She's got two little beautiful little boys. So she's very busy to say the least. So she couldn't get on. Maybe next month we'll have Tawny Basil on from Tawny Fit. So she sent me something uh, to read on air so you guys know what's going on with her. So, gyms have opened, but like many others, you may be hesitant to go back. Starting September 14th, Tawny Fit will be offering training for clients in Millville, New Jersey, right off of Route 55. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and 60 minute sessions will be available. This all comes with nutritional guidance and workouts to do on your own. If you're uninterested in leaving your home, video chat sessions will also still be available. Both of these options will be at a schedule that is most convenient to you. Well, Tawny is well known for that. She will work around your schedule. If you don't think you have time to work out and get in better shape, it's not the case. She will do it with you. She'll guide you on that journey. She'll show you the, the right way to do it so you can lose the weight, you can get in tremendous shape, and that's what she does for a living. And she can do it whether it's a virtual session or now, since the gyms are starting to open again, she can meet you at the gym and you can do it there. Now you can reach Tawny if you're interested in the getting into better shape and doing it with a professional certified trainer. You can reach Tawny on every platform as TawnyFit or TawnyFit at gmail.com. You can reach her that way via her email address. Now, I thought this was really, really super cool. Check this out. This is for my S Factor listeners only. You're not going to find this anywhere else with Tony Fit, but right here on the S Factor. Be sure to include you're a listener to the S Factor and get one free session with your training package. She says, stay, stay safe and healthy. Listen to that, folks. If you tell, if you contact Tony Basil, TawnyFit at gmail.com and you say, I'm interested, work, whatever your goal is. You want to lose weight, you want to get stronger, you want to gain some muscle, you want to over, get in the better, overall better health physically. If you reach out to her and tell, your, tell her you're a listener, one free session with your training package. One free session. That's very generous of her to do that. And thank you, Tawny, for doing that. Hopefully we have you on next month and you can tell us all about uh, how things have been going at the gym since they've uh, reopened not too long ago. Back to the news now. Animal populations worldwide have declined nearly 70% since 
in just 50 years, a new, a new report says. 70%, that seems like an awful lot. It's impossible to deny humans are destroying the natural environment at an unprecedented and alarming rate. According to a new report out Tuesday, animal populations have declined by such a staggering amount that only an overhaul of the world's economic systems could possibly reverse the damage. Nearly 21,000 monitored populations of mammals, fish, birds, and reptiles and amphibians, encompassing almost 4,400 species around the world, have declined an average of 68% between 1970 and 2016, according to the World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report 2020. Species in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as global freshwater inhabitants, were disproportionately impacted, declining on average 94% and 84% respectively. Every two years, the World Wildlife Fund releases its landmark report, revealing how far species populations have declined since 1970, an important marker for the overall health of ecosystems. The latest report indicates that the rate populations are declining signal a fundamentally broken relationship between animals and the natural world, and the consequences of which, as demonstrated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, can be catastrophic. This report reminds us that we destroy the planet at our peril because it is our home. WWF, U.S. President and CEO Carter Roberts said in a statement, as humanity's footprint expands into once wild places, we're devastating species populations. We're also exacerbating climate change and increasing the risk of zoonotic disease like COVID-19. We cannot shield humanity from the impacts of environmental destruction. It's time to restore our broken relationship with nature for the benefit of species and people alike. The report blames humans alone for the dire state of the planet. It points to the exponential growth of human consumption, population, global trade, and urbanization of the last 50 years as key reasons for the unprecedented decline of Earth's resources, which it says the planet is incapable of replenishing. The overuse of these finite resources is at least 56% and has had a devastating effect on biodiversity which is crucial to sustaining human life on Earth. It is like living off 1.56 Earths. That's according to Mathis Wackernagel. The report points to land use change. In particular, the destruction of habitats like rainforest or farming as a key driver for loss of biodiversity, accounting for more than half of its loss in Europe, Central Asia, North America, Latin America, in the Caribbean. Much of that land is being used for agriculture, which is responsible for 80% of global deforestation and makes up 70% of freshwater use. Using this much land requires a vast food system that releases 29% of global greenhouse gases and the excessive amount of land and water that people are using has killed off 70% of terrestrial biodiversity, and 50% of freshwater biodiversity. Now, that's why so many people want to have the, you know, the genetically modified foods. So when you add science to the mix, you use a little bit less land. There's a lot of information out there that says GMOs are bad for you. They've been banned in Europe for quite some time. I know we're still using them in some things in the U.S., but, you know, the whole reason that they want to push in that direction, the whole reason for that is so that we l use less resources and produce more food. Because, of course, our population is always growing. We're at 330 million here in the U.S. That's since the last census count. And we'll see what we are when we get the new census numbers in. But talking about billion, billions of people globally and as, as they become more modern like the U.S. with their diets as they introduce more red meat into their diet. You need land for that. Of course, they talk about the methane that comes from cows when they pass wind. So a lot of that stuff, I mean, the scientists are measuring this. 
and this is the report they come out with. I know it's a, it's a hotbed, it's a hot political topic, the whole global warming situation and how much we're responsible for versus how much is natural. People will debate you endlessly <laughs> over, over that. All I'm simply doing here is reading uh, what's in these reports. And hey, listen, if at any time you want to comment, I know this is a pre-recorded show. If you want to comment on anything that I'm covering, drop me a line. You can go to my website, scienceanimated.net. There's a contact form there. Or if you just want to email me directly, it's info at scienceanimated.net. doesn't matter what news bit I'm talking about or what feature topic, anything that we're talking about here on the Yes Factor, feel free to reach out to me. Social media, facebook.com slash, uh, slash scienceanimated, twitter.com slash scienceanimated, and of course, scienceanimated.net. I want to hear what, you, what your opinions are. It's always interesting. Uh, when I was in the studio and got phone calls, it was... It could get quite lively, especially when it came to global warming reports. So feel free to reach out. Destruction of ecosystems have threatened 1 million species, 500,000 animals and plants, and 500,000 insects with extinction, much of which can be prevented with conservation and restoration efforts. Where and how humans produce food is one of the biggest threats to nature. The report says much of the habitat lost and deforestation that occurs is driven by food production and consumption. One third of all terrestrial land is used for cropping and animal breeding. And of all the water withdrawn from available fresh water resources, 75% is used for crops or livestock. Think about that, folks. First of all, there is very little fresh water. When you think about seawater, salt water, versus fresh water that's available on the planet, the amount of actual fresh water is a small fraction of the amount of seawater. So what's the difference between the two? Well, ocean water you can't drink. You'll dehydrate. You could die from drinking it. Fresh water is exactly as it says, fresh water. The glaciers are full of fresh water. Uh, rain, of course. Fresh water, even though you might want to, you know, uh, treat that before you drink it. But, you know, this is, a, it's a very rare resource. And quite frankly, if every country in the world consumed like we do in America, and, you know, even I'm sure in Europe in some areas where they're more um, almost to our level with consumption, the planet couldn't handle. I don't. I don't think. First of all, the fresh water usage would be would be way too much. Um, so. You know, so some adjustments are going to have to be made when it comes to this stuff. Of course, we turn to science. We see what we can do, what we can figure out. And uh, but this is pretty interesting. I mean, seventy five percent. Used for crops or livestock. That's a lot. Now listen to this. If current hab habitants remain the same, researchers predict the cropland areas may have to be 10 to 25 percent larger in 2050 than in 2005, just to accommodate increased food demand. That increase is expected, despite more than 820 million people facing food insecurity, indicating that much of the agricultural strain is being wasted. That means that we worked and watered and grew through agriculture, produce, raised animals uh, to be eaten. And both of those things, all the effort that went into it, all the water that went into it, all the waste management that went into it, that's horrible. But uh, unfortunately, that's true. Now... Food loss and waste cost the U.S. one trillion. In, that's in, with, with a T. One trillion in economic costs, seven hundred billion in environmental costs, and approximately nine hundred billion in social costs, according to the report. Around the world, an estimated one third of all food produced for humans is lost or wasted. One third. 1.4 billion tons every year. Food waste is responsible for at least 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions, three times more than that from aviation, and nearly one quarter of those emissions come from wasted food. Species 
overexploitation, invasive species, and disease and pollution are all considered threats to biodiversity. The report said, however, human-caused climate change is projected to become as or more important than other drivers of biodiversity loss in the coming decades. Climate change creates an ongoing destructive feedback loop in which the worsening climate leads to the decline in genetic vari variability, species richness, and populations, and that loss of biodiversity adversely affects the climate. For example, deforestation leads to an excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, warming the planet, and exacerbating forest fires. Of course, uh, you know, California has been devastated by these wildfires. It's been terrible. If you've seen some of those images, have you seen some of those images online where it looks like a scene out of a science fiction movie? It's incredible. I mean, it looks like a doctored photo. I mean, that's how bad it looks. Absolutely uh, incredible and uh, really sad. Uh, something's got to be done, you know. I mean, if your person that thinks that, you know, we're not responsible in any way, shape, or form, that's one thing. If your person that's not sure, I mean, at, at some level, you know, we have to try to, to do something, you know. We, we, we're recycling more and we're trying to, you know, yeah, a lot of people are remote working now from home because of the pandemic. We know how much remote work can save on pollution. And, um, you know, I think maybe some people will be doing that, you know, moving forward a little bit. Mostly because of the convenience and it's a little more economical for a person. They don't have travel expense, you know, wear and tear on a car. But... Um, yeah, something's got to be done. I mean, I, I don't know. I, this is not easy. I mean, none of this, none of this, when it comes to climate change and what to do about it, none of it's easy. Let's face it. And people are, you know, arguing all the time over what we're responsible for as humans and what we're not. But I think when you look at the data and you see how much we consume and how much we waste, there has to be some serious education on this stuff. And you know, let's uh, let's try not to be so wasteful with things, and and um, you know, try to help. Let's try to help our situation here. Just a handful of countries—Russia, Canada, Brazil, and Australia—contain regions without a human footprint. But these wilderness areas are facing irreversible erosion, affecting other species and humans' ability to adapt to climate change. According to the report, no part of the ocean is entirely unaffected by overfishing pollution, coastal development, and other human-caused stressors, humans depend on marine ecosystems to provide food. Climate regulation, carbon storage, and coastal protection, all of which are affected by these activities and are sped up by climate change. These places are disappearing in front of our eyes, said James Watson from the University of Queensland and WCS, Brooke Williams from the University of Queensland, and Oscar Vettner from the University of Northern British Columbia. Between devastating wildfires and a COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 has made it clear that humans and nature have never been more intertwined. The report shows that the natural support for human life is rapidly declining, and that it's up to citizens, governments, and business leaders to come together at a scale never before seen to do something about it. Experts express concern that many of the major gains in human health in the past 50 years such as the decreased rate of child mortality and poverty and an increase in life expectancy could be undone or even reversed due to loss of nature. The rate of infectious disease emergencies has increased dramatically over the past 80 years and nearly half of these diseases are connected to land use change, agriculture, and the food industry. One, cited, one study cited by the report suggests that the disease originated in animals are responsible for 2.5 for billion cases of illnesses and nearly 3 million deaths every year. How humanity chooses to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it addresses the looming threats from global environmental change will influence the health of generations to come, wrote Thomas Polowski and Sarah Whitmere of the University of Oxford. Similarly to the economic crash in 2008, lockdowns due to the coronavirus pandemic 
have reduced humanity's demand by nearly 10%, a change that experts say is unlikely to last without major structural change. While the report paints a tragic picture of the future of a natural world, it urges that current trends can be flattened and even reversed without, with urgent action. It emphasizes the need for world leaders to overhaul the food production and consumption industries, taking deforestation completely out of supply chains and making trade more sustainable, among other things. In the last year alone, natural disasters from California's wildfires to severe droughts in Australia have cost billions of dollars globally. Experts warn that economic decision makers need to take into account not only produced in human capital, but also natural capital when crafting public and private policy. To feed 10 billion people by 2050, humans will need to adopt a healthier way of eating, both for themselves and for the planet. Diet-related disease risk is the leading cause of premature mortality globally, and food production is the main driver of biodiversity loss and water pollution, also accounting for 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. Experts recommend humans adopt a diet that consists of a balanced proportion of whole grains, fruits, nuts, vegetables, beans, and pulses, with animal-derived products like fish, eggs, dairy, and meat consum consumed in moderation. Remember, again, like I said earlier, when it comes to anything, your best bet is moderation. If you like to drink socially, whatever you like doing, I mean, that it's all best in moderation, everything. We talked about the, the guy that ate too much licorice earlier. I mean, the guy ate, had a poor diet, and he ate it every day, and you know that compound within the licorice lowered his potassium levels and ended up killing the guy, which was horrible. It comes down to moderation, folks. While the trends are alarming, there's reason to remain optimistic, said WWF Global Chief Scientist Rebecca Shaw. Young generations are becoming acutely aware of the link between planetary health and their own futures. And they are demanding action from our leaders. We must support them in their fight for a just and sustainable planet. Professor Stephen Hawking, years ago, before he passed away, mentioned how humans are going to, we're going to need to leave this planet. And there's a variety of reasons that we should start seriously thinking about that. And I don't, I don't mean, and he didn't mean, leaving this planet entirely and everyone leaving. First of all, right now it's impossible to do that. But... He meant, eventually, people have to start expanding out into our solar system. And we're talking about Mars specifically here, the moon. There are a lot of reasons for that. And one of the reasons for that, for him saying that, is the, the climate change. There are other reasons I talk about here on the S-Factor. There are terrestrial reasons. There are terrestrial threats to our civilization on this earth. There are extraterrestrial threats by way of asteroids, among other things. And, you know, eventually we'll have to really start uh, seriously thinking about that. It seems far-fetched. Doesn't that seem outrageous to say that? Doesn't it seem absolutely insane to say, hey, you know, within the next 150 years, we should really start trying to start to migrate off of the planet. It seems way out there. It seems like, what are you talking about? But listen, let's face it, even if, let's say we had nothing to do with climate change as humans, I mean nothing, let's say, let's say the planet wasn't warming, let's say storms weren't getting worse, the wildfires weren't getting more severe, let's say the Arctic wasn't melting, if all that were true, we should still, let's take global warming out of the mix entirely. If you take it completely off the table, we should still be trying to get off the planet to so our species can survive. If some kind of cataclysm happens, humanity isn't toast. And I think that was more of what Stephen Hawking meant when he said, hey, you better start thinking about it. It'd be a good idea to think about, you know, migrating off of the planet.
So that report was from CBS News. Again, if you want to drop me a line, scienceanimated.net. If you want to straight email me, it's info at scienceanimated.net. Facebook.com slash scienceanimated. Twitter.com slash scienceanimated. Again, I want to thank you for joining me today. Here we are, October 3rd. Thank you for joining me on Cruising 92.1 WVLT. This is the S Factor. S stands for science. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we will be right back. Welcome back to the S Factor. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. Thank you for joining me right here on Cruising 92.1 WVLT. Hey, you can catch me the first Saturday of every month right here on this radio station and also Facebook.com slash Science Animated. Catch me on Twitter.com slash Science Animated. And, of course, the S Factor is brought to you by ScienceAnimated.net. Really appreciate it. If you could go to the, the newly branded YouTube channel, you can get there from ScienceAnimated.net. Hit the subscribe button. Hit a like. Got some uh, creative content always coming out. Some educational content is always rolling out there on the website. Free educational content. And if you want to purchase Science Animated Human Body, that's available as well. It's a feature. And, you know, if you hit subscribe on the YouTube channel, I'd really appreciate that. Trying to get those subscriptions up. Trying to establish that new YouTube channel. That'd be great if you could do that. I got a story here. You might remember this. I covered this. This was the main topic on the S-Factor, I'd say maybe in the beginning of summer. I just read this and I was like, wow, I have, to, I have to mention this on the show because we talked about the brain-eating amoeba, remember that? Well, now there are eight Texas cities where the brain-eating amoeba is found in the water supply. That's kind of terrifying. Residents of eight cities have been alerted that a brain-eating amoeba was found in a southeast Texas water supply, leading one of the towns to issue a disaster declaration. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality issued a water advisory to residents served by the Brazosport Water Authority, warning customers not to use any water due to the presence of the brain-eating amoeba. And Fowlery, remember that? We covered it right here on the S Factor. Oh, by the way, if you miss any of the past S Factors that, that air right here on Cruise 92.1 WVLT, be sure to check out scienceanimated.net. There, there's a podcast version, version of this show and all past shows. The show's been on the air since December 2019, so there's quite a few of them there. If you miss any of them, scienceanimated.net, and you can check out the S Factor portion of that website. But we talked about this brain-eating amoeba, so now here it is in a Texas water supply. They do mention, so they're telling the people to boil the water. Make sure it doesn't go up your nose if you're showering, but before you drink it to boil it. Unbelievable. Well, I wish everybody well out there in, in Texas as they deal with as they deal with that nasty brain-eating amoeba. Be very careful out there. Recently, scientists discovered an Arctic bear that could be between 25,000 and 39,000 years old. It's a prehistoric bear that they found from melting permafrost in the Russian Arctic. And the newest Orbit show that's available at scienceanimated.net talks about that. So check that out. Scienceanimated.net, go to the Orbit show. And of course, everything on scienceanimated.net is family friendly, but that is kind of talked about Orbit is teaching you about that at scienceanimated.net. That was something else that came up uh, since we spoke last. Again, everything links, right? The permafrost is melting, global warming. So we're, we're witnessing this, these prehistoric animals. And by the way, the Arctic bear that they found in Russia, it actually has, it's the first time ever, something like that was discovered with soft tissue. So nose is soft. There's actually soft tissue there. So they're gonna they're gonna do their investigation on that in Russia. It's gonna be very interesting in the upcoming months to see what they find out about that Arctic bear. But there's a fun orbit show on that at scienceanimated.net. I think you'd enjoy it. Your kids would enjoy it. Check it out. So now I'm gonna talk about the feature topic of of the S factor today. 
since Halloween is right around the corner, and of course because of COVID-19, I'm not even sure what kind of, if there's going to be trick-or-treating, you know, near me or nationally, wherever you are listening, I don't know what the situation is going to be, whatever state you happen to be listening to me in, uh, whether it's on Cruise 92.1 WVLT or online on the podcast. But I, I don't know what, what's happening with, with Halloween. I thought it would be kind of cool to do something as it relates to Halloween with the S Factor. Have you ever had an encounter with what you thought was a ghost? Have you ever had an encounter with maybe something happened and you can't quite explain it? Maybe you kind of deem it a supernatural occurrence? If you ever had anything like that happen to you, I want you to reach out to me at scienceanimated.net. I want to know you know, what you've experienced when it comes to what you would perceive as supernatural. There are many people, millions of people that claim that they experience ghostly phenomenon. And of course, yes, factor being about science, I wanted to see what does science say about ghosts? Supernatural phenomenon. What does science say about some of this stuff? We're going to talk about that. I want to take a quick time out and talk about something that is probably affecting lots of people out there. The fact that, you know, gyms were closed. I think they're starting to open now. However, if you find yourself not comfortable with going back to a gym, there's an option for you. And of course, I'm talking about one of my favorite sponsors, Tawny Basil, that and she runs Tawny Fit, which is a way for you to get in the best shape of your life. She's a personal trainer. She's a certified personal trainer, and she will go to a gym and work out with you. She will do it. Uh, virtually with you, which is a, a wonderful thing that is helping people stay in great shape during, you know, this horrible pandemic that we've been uh, confronted with in this country and has enabled people to, it gives them another opportunity to stay in shape. And I was going to have Tawny on the radio show today on the S Factor to talk about what she's doing with her clients. She was then able to come on. She's, she's a new mommy. She's got two little beautiful little boys. So She's very busy to say the least, so she couldn't get on. Maybe next month we'll have Tony Basil on from Tony Fit. So she sent me something uh, to read on air so you guys know what's going on with her. So gyms have opened, but like many others, you may be hesitant to go back. Starting September 14th, Tony Fit will be offering training for clients in Millville, New Jersey, right off of Route 55. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and 60 minute sessions will be available. This all comes with nutritional guidance and workouts to do on your own. If you are uninterested in leaving your home, video chat sessions will also still be available. Both of these options will be at a schedule that is most convenient to you. Well, Tawny is well known for that. She will work around your schedule. If you don't think you have time to work out and get in better shape, it's not the case. She will do it with you. She'll guide you on that journey. She'll show you the, the right way to do it so you can lose the weight. You can get in tremendous shape. And that's what she does for a living. And she can do it whether it's a virtual session or now since the gyms are starting to open again, she can meet you at the gym and you can do it there. Now you can reach Tawny if you're interested in the getting into better shape and doing it with a professional certified trainer. You can reach Tawny on every platform as Tawny Fit or tawnyfit at gmail.com. You can reach her that way via her email address. Now, I thought this was really, really super cool. Check this out. This is for my S Factor listeners only. You're not going to find this anywhere else with Tawny Fit, but right here on the S Factor. Be sure to include you're a listener to the S Factor and get one free session with your training package. She says, stay, stay safe and healthy. Listen to that, folks. If you tell, if you contact Tawny Basil, tawnyfit at gmail.com, and you say, I'm interested, work, whatever your goal is, you want to lose weight, you want to get stronger, you want to gain some muscle, you want to over, get into better, overall better health physically, if you reach out to her, and tell, your, tell her you're a listener, one free session with your training package. One free session. That's very generous of her to do that. And thank you, Tawny, for doing that. Hopefully we have you on next month and you can 
tell us all about uh, how things have been going at the gym since they've uh, reopened not too long ago. Now, because we're in the month of October, I thought it would be kind of fun and kind of different to talk about the supernatural. I think at some point in all of our lives, we have most likely encountered what we think may have been a supernatural occurrence, a supernatural experience. If you think you've had a supernatural experience, I want you to contact me. You can email me directly at info at scienceanimated.net or fill out the contact form at scienceanimated.net. Facebook.com slash scienceanimated, Twitter.com slash scienceanimated. I want to know if you've had any experiences because what I'm about to share with you, this is from the Smithsonian Magazine, and this is what they say they think they can explain ghostly phenomenon with a little bit of science. So that's what we're going to talk about today because that's what the S-Factor is all about, of course. And again, I want to thank you for joining me today on Cruise 92.1 WVLT for the S-Factor. I'm your host, Chuck Shazer. Welcome aboard my starship as we are traveling all over the place, terrestrial and extraterrestrial, and now into the ghostly world, right? So this is five scientific explanations for spooky sensations. What feels like a supernatural presence might actually be vibrations outside of humans' conscious perception. What do you think about that? Tis the season to celebrate the supernatural, whether that means visiting a haunted house or donning a spooky costume. But while some might scare themselves silly in the name of Halloween fun, 42% of Americans believe ghosts are for real, according to a 2013 Harris poll. The belief in ghosts dates back at least to the ancient Mesopotamian times, and it seems to have lodged itself in the collective psyche. But in many cases, science can explain what might seem like a message from beyond. Here are five scientific explanations for encounters with the supernatural. The fear frequency. Just below the average, just below the range of human hearing, infrasound can cause some strange sensations. Humans can't hear below 20 hertz, but some people subconsciously respond to lower frequencies with feelings of fear or dread, reports Jennifer Olette for Gizmondo. In one account from 1998, engineer Vic Tandy of Coventry University spent a night in a lab believed to be haunted. He and his colleagues experienced anxiety and distress, felt cold shivers down their spines, and Tandy even reported seeing a dark blob out of the corner of his eye. It turned out that there was a silent fan creating sound waves at around 19 hertz. The exact frequency that can cause the human eyeball to vibrate and see optical illusions. When we finally switched it off, it was as if a huge weight was lifted, Tandy told Chris Arnott for The Guardian. Think about that. How many times have you just felt like something was watching you? Maybe thought you saw something. That could be the explanation. Unusual magnetic fields. This is a good one. Electromagnetic field, or EMF, meters are commonly used to identify electrical problems. They're also a staple of the ghost hunter's toolbox. Now, neuroscientist Michael Persinger thinks normal variation in electromagnetic fields could be a possible explanation for supposed hauntings. He tested his theory in the 1980s by having people wear helmets that delivered weak magnetic stimulation. 80% of his test subjects said they felt an unexpected presence in the room when they wore the helmets. What's more, famous spooky spots like Hampton Court Palace have been found to have unusual electromagnetic fields. There you go, another explanation, electromagnetic fields. Here's another explanation for the ghostly phenomenon. Carbon monoxide poisoning. On a Halloween episode of this American Life, Life, host Ira Glass and toxologist Albert Donahay unearthed an old ghost story published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 1921. 
As recounted by Miss H, her family moved into an old house and began experiencing what seemed like paranormal activity. The sound of footsteps, strange voices, and even the feeling like they were being held down in their beds by an unseen person. I've heard people say that they have those experiences where they wake up in the middle of the night and they can't move. And they feel like something's... What's more than that is they feel like something is holding them down. Can you imagine such an experience? That'd be terrifying, right? So check this out. Now, you can have that experience like you feel like you're being held down by an unseen person. Meanwhile, the houseplants were dying and Mrs. H's children felt weak and suffered from headaches. A quick investigation revealed that a faulty furnace was filling the house with carbon monoxide fumes. Carbon monoxide poisoning can cause hallucinations and sickness, explaining all of the symptoms. After the furnace was repaired, the haunting stopped. Think about that's and that is very dangerous, by the way. Anytime you have any kind of combustion, whether it's your car or now specifically inside of a home, you have a water heater. If that's run by, well, any kind of fuel or gas, that byproduct has to leave the house. It has to escape. You have to have ventilation to get it the heck out of there. Because otherwise, carbon monoxide poisoning may kill a person. It's very important to get ventilation, get that stuff out of your house, that exhaust. Interesting, right? Carbon monoxide, did you know about that? And by the way, just to throw this out there because I care about my listeners... Make sure you have carbon monoxide detectors in your house. Very important. Now, here's something that I've heard people mention that they experience and they think it's a haunting. Sleep paralysis. The most common explanation for a ghost sighting is sleep paralysis. Sleep specialist Pyril Yadav tells NBC News' Diane Mapes the body is naturally paralyzed during REM sleep, but the feeling of paralysis can cause terror if experienced while awake. Sometimes the body and brain get their wires crossed. And a person can experience a few seconds to a couple minutes of waking paralysis, which is often accompanied by hallucinations. <laughs> Imagine that. You can't move. Now you're seeing things. Now, they say that hallucinations can involve anything from spiders to ghosts and are usually characterized by a feeling of dread. When someone reports a haunting that happened right around bedtime or after waking in the middle of the night, and that they were so scared they couldn't move, it's enough for Yadev to diagnose a case of sleep paralysis. That whole experience sounds frightening. I think it's that's scarier than seeing a ghost. <laughs> you wake up, you can't move. <laughs> Unbelievable. How about this one? The power of suggestion. So, so, social psychology might have an explanation for reported hauntings that the natural sciences can't resolve. Refinery29 reports that one study found the power of suggestion to be strong enough to make people believe they witnessed a supernatural event. Participants watched a video of a purported psychic supposedly bending a key with his mind. The people who were exposed to positive social influence, meaning that an actor in the group said they saw the key bend, were, most, were more likely to report that they saw the key bend too. Participants who were in the room with naysayers and skeptics were more likely to doubt the validity of the trick, but just one person's confident assertion that they believed the psychokinesis was enough to make others believe it as well. Now, we have some very grounded in science explanations for the supernatural. And listen, if you go out for Halloween, wherever you are in the country as you listen to this, whether you're listening on Cruising 92.1 WVLT or on the podcast, or YouTube, or all, all the social media channels for that matter. If you go out trick-or-treating with your kids, just be careful. I know with COVID-19, it's, you know, I, we don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it varies from, from city to city, from state to state, when it comes to the rules for trick-or-treating. Be safe, have fun this Halloween. Looks like the end of the show is right around the corner here. I'm just going to say thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to bring the science news and the featured topic to you guys each and every month, the first Saturday of every month, in fact, right here on Cruise 92.1 WVLT at 1 o'clock. You can catch me here. Again, please visit scienceanimated.net. It's all family-friendly educational content. You can catch past S-Factor radio shows and podcast form there. And, of course, there's a new Orbit show 
right now out there, we had that, that really cool uh, science news bit where an actual Arctic bear, a prehistoric Arctic bear, was discovered because permafrost melted. And it, I mean, it has, you know, soft tissue and everything. An unbelievable discovery that happened very recently. So Orbit goes to Russia to investigate that and see if you can find another one. So it's a fun episode if you want to check that out on the Science Animated YouTube channel. I appreciate a subscribe there and a like. Of course, thank you for visiting my sponsors, doing business with them. It keeps the S Factor rolling. I appreciate that very much. Well, that's going to do it for me today. You can check me out at scienceanimated.net. I want to thank you for joining me. This is Chuck Shazer, and you have been listening and watching The S Factor. Take care, everybody. (laughs) 